shocking talk. <laughs> um, and I think that, you know, I just want to underscore a point that Penn just made. Um, so the, the Solidarity and Green Economy Who Alliance. Are you? Oh, I'm sorry, I'll say it again. I'm Stephen Healy. Thank you. Okay, I thought I had mentioned that initially. I have my apologies. Um, so I've been involved with the Solidarity and Green Economy Alliance organizing this conference, which came out of the Worcester Green Jobs Coalition. But one of the kind of um, impetuses behind this, this community-based organization here in Worcester is precisely the idea that we should begin to think about connections between uh, different, initi different disparate initiatives in the city of Worcester or in Worcester County and how they might be articulated together to produce a different economy, one that prioritizes equity, sustainability, and social justice in the broadest and most embracing sense. So really the point behind this conference is to invite more people into that process. Um, we've been meeting now since I think 2008. We were located in Stone Soup. When Stone Soup burned down, we met in different locations. Currently we meet on a regular basis um, at 5 Pleasant Street, which is right downtown. And in your packet is a series of events um, that are, are coming up that'll give us a further opportunity to really think about how to work together. And in, in the context of this workshop, um, we wanted to throw out a bunch of ideas about how that working together becomes possible. And so Penn's given us an example. Emily's given us a framework. And what I wanted to do was say a little bit about um, something called the Evergreen Initiative, um, largely inspired by a conversation I've had with my fellow stage member, Boone Shear, who's actually been out to visit them. So a couple of preliminary questions. How many of you are familiar with the Evergreen Experiment? Okay, just okay, a few. How many of you have been to Cleveland? Uh, a few of you, right? So Cleveland is a pretty interesting city, and I think one that those of us who live in Worcester, you know, you can kind of, you, there's some similarity, you can sort of feel it. Um, in 1970, Cleveland was a city of 2 million people, and it was a part of the auto industry uh, in the Rust Belt. It's presently a city of 900,000 people, right? So capital flight, and what happens after capital flight is people leave. And the people who remain are the people who can't get out of that city, right? So we're talking about a blighted post-industrial landscape. It's known locally as the mistake on the lake. Right? So it's on the borders of Lake Erie. I'm a geographer, so why not draw it, right? So here's Cleveland. You go to downtown Cleveland, it's really nice, nice shopping mall. And then you can get on a rapid transit system inspired by the famous example in Curitiba and go to a place called the University Circle. And in the University Circle, you pass the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame and the Cleveland Brown Stadium and a bunch of other things. But mostly what you're driving through is a ruined economic landscape. You're driving through communities where average household income is $18,000 per family, and then you arrive at University Circle, home of the Cleveland Clinic, the City University Hospital, Case Western uh, Reserve, which is an engineering school. All of these um, wealthy institutions surrounded by a sea of poverty and um, lack of opportunity. Um, so, uh, you know, a, a number of years ago, uh, this is in the last decade, the people who are sort of principals in that institution got together with a legacy, a legacy institution called the Cleveland Foundation and said, you know what, in every sense of the term, this situation in Cleveland is unsustainable, right? We can't have this pocket of privilege surrounded by a sea of poverty and call this a society worth living in. And they wanted to do something about it. So they made some connections. They connected with a group called the Ohio Center for Employee Ownership, which has been running for at least a couple of decades mostly transitioning manufacturing firms from a kind of conventional capitalist model to different forms of ESOP corporations, to employee stock ownership programs, or even cooperatives in some instance. So they had some, uh, an institutional asset base, some knowledge of how to get this done. But then they took it a step further. They traveled to Spain, to the Mondragon Cooperative Complex. And they studied there. And you can do that because Mondragon makes available the store of knowledge that they have had uh, produce, um, building and running the world's largest group of industrial cooperatives. Uh, you can go to Mondragon's website and read their financials. They are a successful company. They are thriving even in the context of this recessionary climate. Hmm, they might have something to teach us, they thought. So then they did something further, right? So we had, like I said, Case Western, two, two big hospitals, um, 
They come back to Cleveland and they think, okay, we're interested in this model for cooperative development. How can we proceed? Let's do an audit. Let's do an audit of our ongoing institutional demands for goods and services. In this case, power, ecological laundry, and food. Right? Hospitals are enormous consumers of all three of those things. In fact, when they tallied up the amount of uh, consumables that they uh, acquire in meeting their demand, it's something like $3 billion. And of course, like most businesses, they're just setting it out to the lowest bidder. And what they thought was, what if we were to take that $3 billion in aggregate institutional demand and use it as a basis to start businesses that would employ people in the communities that surround the university circle? And let's go, let's, let's, um, let's double down here. What if the people who worked in those businesses also owned them, right? They, their, their personal fortunes get tied to the success of these, um, of these enterprises. They build up an equity stake over time. They start to have capital that they can then use to buy homes or to improve their community. And so they, they decided, uh, and again, this is in the middle of the last decade, and sort of the beginning of the Great Recession, uh, to start cooperatives. Initially an ecological laundry, which employs 50 people. Oh, one minute. Oh, I gotta speed the pace up here. Um, a solar cooperative, uh, that, that um, is going to supply power to these, these businesses, taking advantage of a, uh, a state mandate in Ohio that they wanted 60 megawatts of capacity by about now. They're a little bit behind schedule. And finally, large-scale greenhouses that would supply food to the local hospitals. And again, this is part of a national trend in hospitals. It doesn't make sense to um, treat sick people and then feed them crappy food. Right? This is something that one of my colleagues at Worcester State um, Stephanie Chalupka, who is a, an award-winning um, theorist of how to do nursing responsibly and environmentally, this is something that she can tell, talk to you about uh, in, great, in great detail. Right? So the idea is, we've got the demand, we use a principle from Catholic social doctrine actually called subsidiarity to capitalize these businesses, and then they can become a part of uh, a Cleveland that has been uh, effectively reborn in, in economic terms. There's a few more pieces to this puzzle. Would you mind if I just took the liberty of a minute or two more? Sure, sure. I don't know if this is worth going over. Um, you know, so one of the things that the Cleveland Foundation did was their legacy institution, right? Cleveland at one point was a wealthy city. You can go there and you can see it, just like, I don't know, Worcester for that matter. <laughs> All those nice statues we have, right? So they seeded it with five million dollars of capital, and then they got in touch with a community-based financial institution called Shore Bank, which actually comes out of Chicago and has a history straight, stretching back to the 1970s. And that particular financial institution was able to leverage that for $40 million, right? So now all of a sudden they have a fairly large pool of capital that they can use to make these businesses successful, right? And the laundry is already operating in the black. It got launched in the context of the Great Recession, and it's operating in the black. Very, very interesting, right? And the idea is that they're not going to just stop with three cooperative businesses that are large-scale and capital-intensive. They could create demand for other ancillary services. Now, so this is a model, you know, and I'm just telling you a story. And, but it's one that other people have already heard. So there's a community in California, Richmond, where the city government is saying, you know what, we want to emulate the, green, the evergreen experiment. We want to figure out how to take advantage of those same organizing principles to produce a cooperative economy on a municipal scale. There are a couple of people in this room who are presently involved in an effort at replicating the evergreen experiment in a city called Springfield, Massachusetts, where both my parents are from. Uh, and Springfield is a lot like Cleveland, only smaller, and it's a lot like Worcester, except it's 70 miles from here. Oh, you know, and I'm thinking about it, gee, we, we have hospitals, don't we? A couple of really good ones. We've got 12 universities. Um, we've got people that need jobs. We've got demands that need to be met. And I think, you know, if we work on a cooperative basis, uh, it could become uh, a, a model that we could successfully replicate here. So that's the idea, and I think on some level, like, you know, we could think about it systematically, we can build the relationships to make it happen, and we can also start to create connections with uh, these places where a lot of us, you know, work or do business. I mean, some of us are patients there, some of us belong to universities, but, you know, the idea is 
um, that we can actually change how those institutions operate and create these connections that can produce uh, an economy worth living in, at least from my perspective. So thanks for your attention. And I guess it's a conversation. <laughs>